Hello, welcome everyone. I am going to wait for people to trickle in. Um, I am Julia Davis. I am the owner of the Bookworm Bookstore in Powder Springs, Georgia. Um, I hope you guys have your water, your coffee, your evening drink. Um, sit down. We're going to have a nice discussion with these amazing authors. Absolutely. Um, we will actually go ahead and do some um, housekeeping rules once everyone gets in, but I want to give time for everyone to get settled from their bookseller day. Um, so be sure to shout out your store in the comment section or chat section. Um, we'd love to know where you guys are looking at us from. Um, we'd love to know who's participating. So be sure to do that. We're just going to wait a few more minutes. All right, we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, do a little housekeeping rules. Again, my name is Julia. I am from the Bookworm Bookstore in Powder Springs, Georgia. I want to first thank our sponsors, which are Hachette, Algonquin, uh, Viking Pendant Random House, Sourcebooks Landmark, Avid Reader Press, and Simon and & Schuster. We appreciate you guys for all you do, and thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned, be sure to continue to shout out your, your stores in the chat session. Um, we will not have a Q&A towards the end for you guys, but please feel free in the chat um, to make your comments because we are sharing them with the author. Um, it is going to be a great evening. I know it's been a long day for everyone, so I appreciate you guys for chatting in. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, our first author up is Matthew Quick. Um, he is the author of We Are the Light. Um, Matthew is a New York Times bestselling author of The Silver Linings Playbook, which was made into an Oscar-winning film, The Good Luck of Right Now. He's also written Love My Fall, The Reason You Are Alive, and four young adult novels. His work has been translated into more than 30 languages. He received a Penn Hemingway Award for honorable mention, was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist, a New York Times Book Review Editor choice, and so much more. Um, the Hollywood Reporter has named him one of Hollywood's 25 most powerful authors. He lives with his wife, the novelist Alice Bassetti, on North Carolina's Outer Banks. So welcome, Matthew. Thank you so much. Thanks so for I had me. the pleasure of reading this. So before <laughs> we dive in, um, talk to, tell us a little bit about the book. Well, I started um, writing We Are the Light After. Uh, a long bout with writer's block. And I was coming out of some darkness, personal darkness after getting sober. And I entered into Jungian analysis and very quickly I bonded with my analyst and I became very paranoid about him abandoning me. <laughs> and like I always do uh, with my mental health problems, I, I, I took it into a creative writing wrestling ring and wrestled it down onto the page. And I came up with this character by the name of Lucas Goodgame and Lucas on page one of We Are the Light is indeed abandoned by his Jungian analysis, analyst at the absolute worst time in his life uh, after experiencing this horrific tragedy that takes his wife's life from him. And uh, he tries to heroically woo his analyst back by writing to him. And through these letters, you see how his psyche kind of copes with the tragedy. And early on in the novel, he teams up with one of his former students, this young man named Eli, and they decide they're gonna embark on this art project that they think might heal them and in the entire community. We Are the Light is um, a novel that celebrates positive masculinity uh, as, as a way to defeat toxic masculinity. It holds up a need for depolarized spaces, places where we can come together and lift each other up rather than tear each other apart. And it's my all out love letter to narrative and art and the power uh, of those things to, to heal us. I wrote this book when I was, again, I was in a really dark place and I was looking for some light and I think I found it. And my hope is that when people read this book, they'll, they'll find the light too and share it with their communities. Yeah, I, it really was a, I will say I love, cause you just mentioned your um, addiction or former mm. addiction. Um, yeah. And I love the openness um, in that opening letter. Um, Thank you. Your readers, um, it made you vulnerable. It made you real. Um, I think you. it, it you. laid a great foundation. And yes, you did um, accomplish what you set out to do. So um, how hard was it for you to be 
that open, knowing the world now knows and is going to look at the <laughs> page, like before it even gets to the book, it's like, bam, there you are, first line. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting, right? Because the book is not about alcoholism at all. Like Lucas doesn't have a substance abuse problem, but my editor and I talked about it and we thought it was really important to let people know how this book came to be because it's about vulnerability. And for me, um, I, I think that it's, I've always thought that putting things out there and being honest about where the fiction comes from is the only way forward. And I think that that five-year writer's block hiatus was me struggling with how do I, how do I be a sober writer and without the tool of alcohol to numb all of those bad things, how do I be that vulnerable without the crutch of alcohol? And so that, that was the, the journey over the last five years. So um, it, it took a bit of working myself up to get to write that letter. But at this point in my life, I feel very comfortable putting it out there. Uh, and I, I thank you for doing it. Like I mentioned, it was thank definitely you. very you. powerful. Um, and without giving too much away, um, this <laughs> the topic is is definitely time, timely. Um, mm. The quote unquote incident and things that happened. Um, and I, we all know you didn't plan it for it to be that way. Um, no, no. <laughs> this book coming out during not too far after after that, um, are you nervous? Are you, what do you want people to take away from it? Yeah, um, I, I don't think that the book is really about a mass tragedy. You know, the book starts off with that's, that's in the, the past with these characters. The book is really about communities, a small community coming together and taking care of each other. And I think that we need that more than ever. Um, and so I hope when people read this book, uh, they realize that, wow, there's a lot of important political work to do. And there's a lot of um, important kind of hot button issue uh, things to talk about. It's also really important to make sure your neighbor's mental health is okay. And that the kid down the street has, has a father figure. And uh, I think that those small kind of relationships that maybe get lost in the headlines of, you know, social media and the newspaper are what I, I would like people to focus on when, when they read the book. It's about human connection. It's about getting, getting back to what brings us together and makes us feel whole and sane and healthy. And so I hope that that's what people will think about when they read the book. That's good. And it's, it's funny you mentioned that because there are, like, there's... I, I love, I'm a word person. I'm a word person. I'm a paper person. I mean, I own a bookstore, mm. so clearly. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So there is something um, you mentioned in page 163, 164-ish. So it's kind of in the middle of the book. Um, and I'm not giving anything away, but um, there is there is some gun violence within the book. Um, mm. and there, the character says, um, because he wants to mention that that gunshot or a gunshot um, mm. with what they're working on. And the character says, how can we transcend something we won't even face in fiction? Um, yep. Because they didn't want it to go through. And you, you proceeded to say medicine tastes bad, but it does heal. Um, yeah. That to me was, was a powerful statement in the midst of this tragedy. And you're right. If we don't face these things um, on paper, how are we going to yeah. fix it? Um, was that part of your healing? Was that just something? I mean, it just, it flowed. It looked amazing in there. I don't Thank know if that you. was the intent, you. but it stopped and made me think. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that I was thinking more about facing mental health problems at the time. I was facing my own personal demons, which was not um, about gun violence, you know, thank God for that. Um, but I think what I was attempting to process was, you know, I, I think I might've been cheerleading subconsciously for myself. You know, mm -hmm. if I can't put this stuff out there in, in fiction, how am I gonna deal with it in my real life? Mm -hmm. And fiction has always been the place since I was a teenager that I went to find the answers and to process feelings and to, to test out um, who I was and, you know, to put on different hats and, and just kind of process my emotions. And so, you know, the writing process is very much like that for me as well. But I thank you for bringing up that line. It's very, uh, very well thank you. pointed out. Thank you. Yeah. I wish I could say I wrote it, but 
<laughs> my name Matthew Quick wrote it. It wasn't me. Um, um, one of my final questions for you, um, you use angels um, mm. within your story to represent those that have passed on. It was just so um, peaceful. Um, mm. The, mm. You Thank mentioned you. Um, feathers and just the angelic piece of it. Um, was that how does that fit into it? Because religion did play a little part in within your story. Um, and just the way you, like I envisioned every time I saw the angels or every time I saw the feathers, um, was it meant to be that powerful? Do you want to, without giving anything away, of course? Well, of course I was, I was trying to make it powerful. <laughs> These questions are wonderful, by the way. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I grew up in a, a very religious household um, growing up. And so I, I have a strong, um, my family was Methodist. We have had a very strong education there. And I, I don't attend church now, but it is, it is something that um, I wrestle with. You know, my worldview, my, since I was a child, was, was through that religion. And so now as I'm writing, I'm, I'm, I, I, I always kind of go back to that. And I kind of pull from that. And I try to... Um, include that. That's part of who I am. And so it, it makes its way into my work quite a lot. And if it's powerful, I'm that much better. <laughs> it was. It definitely was powerful for me. Um, I think Thank it you. is definitely Thank something we as booksellers will will definitely enjoy. Um, so I thank you. Thank you for your work. I thank you for coming out of your your writer's block. Um, thank you. So, thank you. Um, and, and best of luck on the release when it comes out. So Thank you. Thank you. This was a wonderful interview. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank um, you. So next up, we have Ross Gay. He is the writer of Inciting Joy. Um, Ross is another New York Times bestselling author um, of the Book of Delights, essays, and four books of poetry. His catalog um, won the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award and the 2016 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. He was also a finalist for the National Book Award, and he's been holding, he, I'm sorry, and be holding won the 2021 Pan American Gene Stein Book Award. He is a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, which is a nonprofit, free fruit for all food justice and joy project. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Gay. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, tell <laughs> me about this book right here. Yeah, you know, um, one thing I, I love, um, first of all, let me just say I'm glad to be here. Like um, all the rest of us, I love independent bookstores. I was just at the local one where I am right now, the Frenchtown Bookstore, awesome little bookstore um, in New Jersey. You know, like, so anyway, I just feel tremendously grateful to you all. Mm -hmm. And like, I can't remember if it was AM or Christine. I don't know who said it, but someone said, man, it's the best. Like, it's booksellers. Like, we could talk to you. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> lucky to talk to you. Um, so let me just start with that. Something that Matthew said about like the sort of attending to small, these small, often overlooked relationships or connections. And one of the things that I think this book, Inciting Joy, is about is really trying to figure out, well, first of all, it offers a kind of definition of joy. And the definition of joy that it offers, and it kind of is like in process and revising, and is it revising after the book is out still, is something along the lines of like that which emanates from the tethers between us as we hold each other through our sorrow. So what emanates from the tethers? Or what emanates from the, like I like to think of the mushrooms, from the mycelium or the rhizome, you know? What is that light that comes off of that as we hold each other through our sorrow? And, and then, so my second question is like, so, you know, I wanna know what incites that? What incites that luminousness or that illumination? And the second question is, what does that illumination, what does that light, what does that joy incite? So I sort of meditate on a handful of, I think there's like 13 essays in it. And I, I meditate on a handful of, you know, like subjects that to me are sort of maybe fruitful things to explore in terms of the ways that they incite joy, practices say. And one of them, I have an essay about sort of being with my father as he dies. Another one is about pickup basketball. Another essay is about um, orcharding, you know, because I've worked with this community orchard for, for years. It always makes me happy to hear people say in my bio, the a free fruit for all. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's worth the price of the ticket for me. Um, 
I have one about dance. I have one about cover songs. Um, I have one about the relationship between joy and gratitude, which is also a, uh, an essay about joy and gratitude and refusal. Mm -hmm. Refusal as a kind of um, possible sight and incitement of joy. So my question, that's sort of my question. It's a series of questions. And ultimately I kind of want to know, like again, to say it again, what are the things that incites joy? And what are the things? And when I say in the introduction, I say something like the most rambunctious, mongrel, transgressive connections we could ever imagine. That's what joy incites, I suspect. Yes, and it's funny that you mentioned through through my tears. Um, that was actually my first question. Um, oh, yeah. That was one of my favorite essays. Um, mm. One that was also difficult for me to read um, mm. because my father recently passed. So. Mm. Um, being difficult for me to read, how difficult was it for you to write that one? Um, or yeah. was it difficult for you to write that one? It, it was, it was, yeah, so for folks who don't know it, it's uh, it's basically an essay where I, you know, my father was diagnosed, this is a while ago, he was diagnosed in 2000, and, man, was that, four. <laughs> it was like yesterday. Okay. Diagnosed with liver cancer, and then you know it was the period of his dying over um, um, for five six months. Um, the kind of re revisiting that in a you know it's both. It's both like I mean, and that's part of the question I think, or the or the or the endeavor in a way is heartbreaking, you know, completely heartbreaking. Um, just as it was heartbreaking to be with my father as he was dying, and just as it was the most meaningful thing I've ever done in my life, you know. Um, so I would say it was, yeah, it was, it was difficult to write it, but it was also in some kind of way, it was like still knitting me together to him, knitting me to him. And also this process of like, you know, I'm lucky enough to have like a mother who wants to hear what I'm writing <laughs> and, and a brother and beloved who want to hear what I'm writing. So part of my writing process was actually to be like, Hey, I wrote this essay about dad's dying and us going through that mm -hmm. and to be like, you know, mom, Maddie, let me read this to you all. And um, to sit down and be with them and them to be like, that you forgot this. Or, or did that really, wow, that happened to you. I wasn't there for that. On and on and on, you know, which is okay. just, again, so the experience of being with my father's death still, which I will never be without, is an opportunity for me and my brother and my mother to get, to hold each other, mm -hmm. you know. That's what I'm studying. That's what I'm trying to study. And it's interesting. Family is definitely um, important to you throughout the book. Um, yeah. So, and you you make it a point to find joy in in your grief um, throughout the book. Um, how easy is that? Can you teach me how to do that? <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> but I, we can teach each other how to do it. That's there the you thing. Go. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's the thing. Like, I don't think joy exists absent grief. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't, I think that's, yeah, I think that's something else. Mm -hmm. And something else that's valuable and wonderful. You know, I write about delight. And I think delight, um, you know, it's always adjacent to, because everything's adjacent to sorrow, because we are all in, in fact dying and everything that we love is dying. But, but sometimes I think of delight as more fleeting and it might not actually have the kind of gravity that joy has. And joy to me is not joy if it is not also cognizant, whether sort of consciously or unconsciously in some sort of deep bodily way of the fact that sorrow con sorrow is, uh, you know, also the fabric of our lives. By which I mean, I don't mean like, you know, I basically I mean that things change, mm -hmm. you know, and who we love will not always be there. And who we are will not always be there. You know, all kinds of things like that. So yeah, so I feel like, but also when to your question, I feel like, I also feel like we don't do it alone. Mm -hmm. Sorrow is dependent on connection. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, joy is con just like sorrow actually, but joy is connect dependent on connection. You are such a poet. Um, when I do poetry night over here, I need you to come to Georgia yeah. for me. Um, I'll come to just, just come to Georgia. Um, <laughs> let's talk about this cover. Mm. So, um, amazing cover. And I know a lot of times authors don't always have input into the cover. Um, yeah. This speaks joy to me. Um, did you have any any input in that? 
Yeah, I totally did. It's funny because the last book that I did with Algonquin, um, um, I, I think I was really a pain in the ass on the cover. Like, it was probably <laughs> like 30 or 40, and they were like getting really <laughs> fed up with me. <laughs> and then and with this one, it was like one shot, and I was like, oh, what about this and this? Boom. It was like, all right, I think that's probably the cover. Mm-hmm. You know, so they they really nailed it. And one thing that I love, too, about this, and I didn't get to talk to the designer about this directly, but is that flower on. The, yeah, that flower on the cover is um, it to me, it references an essay back from the book before, which is actually kind of a prelude in a way to this inciting joy book, The Book of Delights. There's a book I have about a flower growing from a curve. Uh, there's an essay I have about a flower growing from a curve. And I swear that's exactly that's the flower. They somehow found that flower from 2015, you know, <laughs> a curve on street in Bloomington. It is amazing outside of being pink because pink is my least favorite color, but it still <laughs> looks amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, thank you again. Another great book. I, I encourage you um, all to, to put this one on your radar as well. Um, so again, thank you for joining us and letting me ask you those questions. Um, Next up is A.M. Holmes. She is the author of The Unfolding. Um, the Unfolding comes out next month. Um, A.M. is the author of 13 books, among them the best-selling memoir, The Mistress Daughter, the novels. This book will save your life, The End of Alice and Jack, and the short story collections of Days of Awe, uh, The Safety of Objects and Things You Should Know. She also writes for film and television and teaches in the creative writing program of Princeton University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, And and Ross and Matthew, and I'm sure Christina second, I'm so excited to hear it. So, you know, when you work, you live in a vacuum. And so you don't hear about anything. You don't know anything. I'm like, wait, I can't wait to read these books. So that's just hearing people talk about things that they're making is, is like fills my heart. So thank you. Um, what can I tell you about the unfolding? This is the first time I've talked about it. So I would say the best description I can offer at the moment is to say quite a few years ago, I started getting increasingly anxious um, that I felt like something weird was happening in this country and that we were sort of at a point where the sort of American political system was losing touch with the American people. And suddenly words that we used to kind of agree on what they meant, like democracy, or like things that we used to think were facts, all of a sudden started meaning different things to different people. And so I started making notes and I, when I told my editor what I was thinking about and I was getting really worried that something bad is going on and no one's talking about it yet. uh, They said to me, well, you don't write science fiction. And I said, I know, but there's something weird out there. And so I just kind of kept working away quietly. And then funny enough, a writer friend said to me, well, important to whatever you're doing, because you're sort of talking about these big kind of lofty ideas, um, stick to the characters. And so that also made me think about how traditionally, you know, in our country, men write the great American novel, the large scale social political thing. And women, this is what Grace Paley, my beloved teacher, talked to me about. And women get to write the domestic interior. And I thought, well, how can I braid those two together? So I ended up writing a story that starts um, on election night in 2008 when, as the main characters would describe it, John McCain loses to Barack Obama and it goes up until the inauguration day. So it's only probably like eight weeks or so. And it's really about a group of men who are very unhappy and they feel like they've lost control of their vision of America. And what are they gonna do about it? Which now is of course terrifying, right? Because I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. Um, and then within that, there's this braided narrative about a, the, a family and, the, and the, the young daughter and the family and the wife who really have kind of lost a lot in relation to growing up in this household. And what does it mean to be a woman? And what does it to mean to be a w- woman in two different generations at the same time? So I feel like I wanted to create a weave that really was about where we are in America, how we got here, and very much about you know families and this larger social political moment we're in uh and it's it's frightening uh, hopefully it's also funny i tried to make i feel like the only way to be funny or frightening is to be funny too so well i i will say this one was a tough one this was a I'm tough sure. read for me um this was um a very realistic book um and it was a tough tough read um yeah. 
So that being said, I, I would love to know, um, and I, I know that had to do with who I am. Um, well, the, the election in and of itself was was a tough election. Um, so who's your target audience for this? Like, what was the goal right. of writing this one? So inter- that's a really good question. And, and I appreciate you saying that because uh, this sounds weird to say, it's okay to me that it, it's important to me that it's a tough read. I don't, I don't write things that, I mean, I, I want them to be entertaining, but I also really want them to be thought provoking and, and to cause many layers of feelings for people. I mean, this is, you know, one of the threads that's that's woven through this, there's two. One is, is racism and sexism that are in a way rampant and rampant in this country. So as much as they are not, um, I mean, they are on the table as this discussion. So I think that's, that's part of it. In terms of who's the audience, you know, I don't think that way. I mean, I really, you know, I want all kinds of people to read this book. I want people to read this book and say, wow, I've never actually seen this person in person before. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've never seen the big guy. I've never seen this scary, wealthy, older white man who's desperate not to give up power. I mean, that's that's a big piece of that. Um, and I've never seen also the the women in his orbit begin to hold him accountable. I mean, there's a moment to me that's really important in the book where the big guy says, like, basically, what is it when you realize that you're an asshole? And how does he live with himself to realize that? And that to me is, I mean, that's like the biggest moment in the whole thing. So I think I don't, you know, I'm I'm not writing books, it's weird to say, to make people happy, although I, I so appreciate joy in things. I'm writing books to really provoke conversation and to make people think and look at who we are and how we got here, which I don't know if that helps the difficulty of the read. (laughs) Well, and I guess um, what made you being a a novel um, it, and it truly reads more um, like a nonfiction. What made you choose that particular election? What made you choose to, you could have gone the, a generic election or just made up some folks. Um, That's a, sure. What, That's so yeah. I would love to know what, what triggered that particular. Right. right. That's a great question. Um, well, you know, I, I am someone who loves history and I'm obsessed with history. And I grew up in Washington, DC in the early sixties and through the seventies. And so there was a period of enormous um, unrest and change and so on. And I think, Part of why I chose this election was to me, that was, it, I mean, there's there's such dissonance in this country. And that election, I think, really tripped off a kind of, on the one hand, for many people, including me, enormous celebration. I live in New York now. You know, we all took to the streets. I bought a new TV for that night. I was like, you know, uh, I'm going big here. And um, and yet, I think that that for the people who hold power in this country, it was really terrifying. And so I really wanted to look at, I I look at where we've been and, you know, in my, I had hoped originally this book would come out before the last elections or before last November. And then all my friends said to me, it's good. It didn't because January 6th happened and you would be in so much trouble now because that's really what this book (laughs) leads up to. And I think, I mean, I hate to like be like, wow, but I, you know, it's like, how did we get to that moment? And then obviously the big question too is where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. And who are we and who are we to each other? And that's what I'm always really writing about. I'm writing about human behavior and our social, moral, cultural lives. So, yeah. And I felt and and there's so much in this book, too, besides the Obama McCain sort of story in that election. There's it's filled with history. So there's history that goes back to Eisenhower Mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the plans for in case of nuclear attack and tons of I mean, there's so many things in here that. I would say if people think they're made up, those are the things that are real. The weirder it is, the truer it is in here. Um, And that was, you know, in many ways fun for me because I really am a deep, deep history buff, including like, I, you know, this may sound like I'm naive, but I didn't even realize that George Washington was originally a British soldier and he was he was unhappy with how much he was being paid. So he was like a disgruntled British employee who then thought, you know, what, I'm not fighting for this side anymore. And to me, that's amazing. And I mean, in theory, I should know that we all should know all these things. But so that's part of it, too, was weaving actual history into that and thinking about how does all of that play out in this country? 
Um, and you mentioned the main character's name is Big Guy. Um, Big Guy, yeah. The only one in the book that does not have a name um, outside yes. of Big Guy. Yes. Um, was that, how intentional was that? How important was that to the storyline? Because I will say, and again, yeah. being being that it was the difficult read, yeah. um, it, it definitely made, um, you're right, if it would have came out <laughs> the other election, yeah. um, a whole do, it, it would have added to the, the meaning um mm -hmm. but was that the intent is that why you didn't name him did you always have him in your head as big guy oh you mean do i think that he's donald trump <laughs> no i don't is that what you mean I didn't say that oh okay no i don't i think that, it's, <laughs> this is this is even going to sound worse i think there are many big guys i mean i think that it is a euphemism or a tag for a kind of man that there are many iterations of and that many of us experience along mm -hmm. the way in different ways so to me, it's interesting because I didn't like sit down and structurally think, oh, by not naming him beyond that mm -hmm. um, or referring to him beyond that as, you know, what am I doing? But I feel like he's more this like large entity that many, many people have to deal with. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. But. It, it does. It answers the question. It, it does just, just because it does, as you mentioned, um, the capital situation. And that's why I said it, it yeah. it's very, um, the some of the wording where, yeah. for me, where it was sometimes supposed to be humorous, I don't know if I found the humor in that. Um, that's okay. Yeah. So that's where I think um, I would love to know. That's why I asked with the big yeah. guy. The big guy, I see him as, in my world, um, people that I face regularly exactly um, but that is so, who he is that mm -hmm. is exactly right he's not there he's not one big guy there mm -hmm. are many 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 big guys and there's different iterations there's big guys who are really big and there's big guys who are a little smaller but is it is also in a weird way too the obliviousness of the big guy which I think you know comes up that, that you know the one hand we talk a lot about people needing to sort of check their privilege but there is a kind of person who is also totally oblivious and doesn't even see the way that they move through the world or the impact it has on people. And I think that's part of the role he's playing. And I, I, I mean, he is, the guys in this book are problematic and they are meant to be problematic. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 you know, and this is also a thing that I've always done in my fiction, which is I often will pick the least likely character, right? To tell you the story. So I'm not picking, you know, a pleasant version of this. I'm literally showing you people that we don't see or hear from certainly in fiction, but we absolutely experience them pretty much every day mm -hmm. um, in simple ways and small ways and also in very large ways, which I also wanted to look at that sort of blend between the public and the private self and the, the interior domestic and even what is that relationship like in a family. Um, so that, I mean, all of that is super interesting to me, you know, and I would say in some ways to somebody like, I mean, I also think there may be times where people might even think I'm trying to be funny. And I'm like, that's not funny. That's not the funny part. That's painful, you know? Um, but to me, that's all very real. Um, and if it hurts to read and is upsetting to read, I think that's important. I mean, I think that, again, it's like that way of like, how do we have the hard conversations? How do we face who we are to each other and what we hope for from each other? And I think in some ways, as the story moves and as the big guy realizes what a jerk he is, there are the beginnings of that. And we see that also with his friend, Tony, who has led a life as a closeted gay guy in Washington, which, you know, when I was growing up, that was there, that's what how gay men lived in Washington. They worked for the government and were closeted. And many people I knew like died of AIDS, as Tony mentions. In the book. So it's a complicated weave. Mm -hmm. One, one quote yeah. that um, in, from your book, um, you mentioned in or the character mentions we haven't changed the world around us has changed but our little bubble has remained the same we have had the luxury of doing nothing not changing while the world around us is coming of age um i thought that was a it goes on for some other stuff but i thought that was definitely a hmm we need to think about things and and yes i think your book is definitely going to um trigger some conversations um and maybe it could pop the bubble a little bit. I mean, that would be okay, you know, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <Exactly>. um, <laughs> so um, again, I thank you too. There is definitely more than the, the political piece of it. Um, 
I I love how you had his daughter as a first time voter. Um, those are important things that were, of course, in the book. So it, it's definitely, I think yours comes out, yes, in September. So here's another one. So thank you so much for joining thank us. You. And I'm gonna put, I'll put my info in the chat because if anyone wants to talk more about it, I'm here to talk about it. I mean, I wrote it and I absolutely am game for, you know, difficult or whatever conversation. I absolutely. appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank so you. Thank you. So next up we have, the Ways We Hide, which is our last final author, which is Christina McMorris. Christina is a New York Times bestselling author of two novellas and six novels, including the runaway bestseller Sold on a Monday, initially inspired by her grandparents' World War II courtship letters. Her works of fiction have garnered more than 20 national literary awards. So welcome, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about this one. Absolutely. So, and I just have to say that this is one of those things that you really want someone like Ross to go last because all of our answers sound like C. Jane Run. <laughs> so, so beautifully put with his quotes. Um, so in short, The Ways We Hide is about a female illusionist in America who is the mastermind behind an escape show in 1942. And the reason why she's so good at escape is because of a childhood trauma that she survived that traces back to a true story that is, as you know, is absolutely heart-wrenching in Michigan's copper country. Mm -hmm. And because of this, she gains an incredible skill set, very unique. And because of that, she is recruited by a British military intelligence group called MI9. Now we're all familiar, I'm sure, with MI5 and 6, and usually not 9. And there's a reason for that. They were highly classified. They were very specialized. And what they would do is they would create escape and evasion devices to uh, that they would sneak into almost anything you can think of, including how I discovered it first, monopoly boards. <laughs> and they would smuggle those into care packages sent to POWs, uh, into POW camps to help allies escape. And also in some creative ways, arm uh, downed airmen in occupied zones to evade Nazi capture. And in the story, my character gets so involved in this group that she gets pulled much deeper into the war than she ever expects. And I love, I recently have a newfound love for historical fiction. Um, so um, historical fiction books are always great for me right now. Um, I do love um, how you said the, the book came to be in your author's note um, in the back of the book. Would you, you want to talk to us a little bit about? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happened was just like Soul on a Monday and let me say, oh my gosh. So Soul on a Monday, by the way, a little side note, because we're talking to booksellers, can I just tell you that, um, that that was one of those books that, you know, you hope that we all hope, right. That are more than our friends and family will, will actually buy our books. <laughs> and we're so thrilled when a stranger does. Um, and Sold on a Monday, by the way, was one that, that I, I had this like anxiety right before the book came out. I thought this was a mistake. I should have written it from the kid's perspective. It's going to fail. I'm going to write the next book as fast as possible so we can all forget this ever happened. Um, and it shows you how clueless I am because because of booksellers, um, it, we just hit a million copies, which is all kinds of surreal when you think a book is going to bomb. <laughs> you know, we all think the first book's going to hit a million copies and we're almost always wrong. So anyway, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, booksellers. Oh my goodness. Could not have done that without you. And you're putting my kids through college. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so to tie this back together, Sold on a Monday was inspired by a photograph, as you may know, and it was this shocking photograph of kids being offered for sale on their on their own farmhouse porch, um, or actually in my story it was farmhouse in the in real life, it was an apartment stoop. In the same rabbit hole I went down, which was online, you know, that you click on, we all clicked, right? Where it said 50, the most shocking historical photos you have never seen. <laughs> and you think, what 50 photos have I never seen? So I went down the rabbit hole and I found that photo. And right next to it actually was another photograph. And it was so haunting, but so depressing um, and sad about a tragedy about children that it haunted me. I put it in a file but I didn't think I could ever write about it because it just seemed way too sad. Um, and so when I circled back, coming up with a new idea, I'm not the author that all I'm, if you, if the three of you are this, I don't want to hear about it. That if you always have 20 ideas going at once and you can't pick, um, I always have one and I'm obsessed with it. And when I'm done, I think I'm out of ideas for the rest of my life. So I'm okay. really excited when I find something new. And I went through my old file and I came across some things I'd put in there. And I thought trying to get inspired. 
One was that photograph of the children and that had to do with Copper Country. The other one was an article that had to do with how Monopoly helped win World War II. And and I thought, you know, I was fascinated by it too, didn't think it would be a whole novel before. And suddenly I started putting it together. And within about 15 minutes, I had at least half, if not two thirds of my story in my head, like a movie, it just played out. (laughs) And I realized that this character, as you well know, is a survivor of the tragedy. So without giving too much away, um, is a survivor of this tra- of real life tragedy that I thought, how do people not know about this? Um, and so she survives it. And because of because it has to do with some claustrophobia, she becomes obsessed with escape and becomes obsessed with Houdini. And I thought if she becomes obsessed with Houdini and always needs two ways out of every room um, and has trauma from that, she would be a natural person that would be obsessed with escape. And so in real life, MI9 did use real magicians, which is incredible, and real life characters and real you know, historical figures that inspired the character of Q from James Bond. You took one of my questions. <gasps> oh, okay. Okay. I'm no, sure you, uh, I, I'll just keep talking to you, come up with another question. No, no I have plenty. Um, <laughs> but I love how you, um, the magic, the Houdini, um, in the storyline and how just that that childhood love turned into something career-wise from a a female perspective um just something on a high level so how just reminding like that child that whatever dream you have you can turn it into something amazing so I, I was gonna ask you how that came into play but you already yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I've always been, I mean, aren't we all just fascinated with like card tricks and the close up magic and sleight of hand? I mean, all of that is just so fascinating to me. I only have, I think, two tricks that I've known since I was probably 12. I can still do them. <laughs> Not very impressive. If you look close, you're going to be very disappointed. Um, but yeah, I just, I find, I just, I, it was amazing to me all, of, you know, how many books have been written about World War II and yet when you come across a nugget like that um, and think, how did I not know this before? That magicians were used in World War II um, and the things that they created that were ingenious. And I'll, I actually do have one little show and tell. I'll show you this. And I do have in my nine gadgets um, that I keep putting on my, my Facebook author page and all that, that are phenomenal, the things that they came up with. But here's one that's easy to show. And um, this is a silk map that they oh. smuggled, as you know, in the story that they literally put, this is from World War II, and they would put it inside the Monopoly board with wow. a, a compass, two files, and, and then this map so that when the POWs ripped it open and burned the evidence, they could then help escape. And the reason why they used a silk map is so, so smart. And that's because, first of all, it's in color, which is pretty cool. Um, it would withstand the weather um, and, you know, rain and dropped in puddles, what have you. And it would also not... Um, Russell, if you were trying to hide. So little things like that were just incredible. It's stranger than fiction and it has to go in a book. I love it. And I love you do add some resources in the back, um, which are great. I always love that when it comes to to history, because again, historical fiction for me wasn't always a love um, for books. So I love that I can now research and go back because I only did what I needed to do in history class to get the A. We all, yeah, we all did. But when you're memorizing, you know, right, dates and names and they don't mean anything to you and you regurgitate them and you get an A, you know, but instead of when you, that's why I love about historical fiction too, myself, that you, I call it literary Advil and that you get the sugar coating of a story on the outside and hopefully you don't realize how much good stuff on the inside you're getting until it's over. And hopefully you get to look back and think, wow, I just, I learned a lot too when it's well-researched. So the Dutch resistance was another big element of this book, as you know, and that was fascinating me because we hear a lot about the French resistance and very little about the Dutch. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love, and I love how you used um, the different languages and pieces of it. Um, you had me pulling out the translator. Um, <laughs> Google but, Translate was my friend. Yes. <laughs> um, but I love that. I always love that in a book. Um, you guys have been great. Um, I do have a final, I want to wrap up with some fun. Um, I know in reading some of these books, a lot of this stuff happened during COVID, um, during the, when we were locked up, um, even though we're still, we're still in a funky space, but we were kind of tied to things and it, it required everyone to, to think and process and do, um, do some things. Um, what we rarely talk about is the joy, you like that? Joy that we actually um, found during that time. Um, so I would love to know, I know for me, um, in the middle of COVID, I purchased the bookstore. Um, who does that? But I purchased my bookstore in November of 2020. Um, amazing joy for me. 
um, in the middle of what is perceived as chaos. I would love to know um, now that we're, we're, what did you learn? What was that, that amazing joy that you learned out of this crazy time? Um, and whoever wants to go first, go for it. Man, come on. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, which isn't <laughs> so, so great with Amazing Joyce. So I actually had COVID like in March of 2020 here in New York and was really, really sick. And so it took me, and I, I didn't want to tell my students. So I was like Zoom teaching, you know, while half <laughs> passing out and whatever. Um, but I was, I, at some point I was able to sort of get out of the city a little bit. And two things were happening for me. One is I was obviously finishing this book and the world was very, as you know, chaotic and the political landscape. So I kept trying not to write in reaction to things. But the big piece for me and, and the true joy came out of spending some time literally in nature and, and literally watching that spring because I was just lying on the sofa really sick. <laughs> but watching leaves come back on trees and getting a bird feeder and actually seeing birds come and realizing who lived around me in the natural world. And that was, I would say, an enormous source of, uh, you can hear I have actual birds next to me, but an enormous <laughs> source of great comfort, but also um, like some sense that, okay, the world will go on, that things will, you know, that the cycles of life will continue. And I needed that because it was it was a dark, dark time. All right. I'm going to be a school teacher right now. Matthew. I started a movie club with my friend, a long distance movie club. And um, we did it just a way to pass the time. We took turns picking films and we watched a bunch of old films that we would have never seen before. And um, it really deepened my friendship with my, my buddy, Kent. We kind of had like a, you know, it was just something to do every week. So we were showing up and we weren't only just talking about film, we were talking about our lives and, and uh, it became, so much more than just watching films and we would have never done it if it wasn't for the pandemic and we weren't just bored at home and uh you know it was a time too when it, it was kind of in the middle of my early sobriety and it was going through a lot and it was just this steady friendship and like kind of learning the value of just somebody showing up every week to do something simple and in a lot of ways that's what my, my novel is about it's about people showing up to do simple things for other people and so that was a really important part of my pandemic experience. Great. How about you, Christina? So similarly with the movies, um, <laughs> both my boys are, they're 16 and 18 going on 40 and had somehow not seen The Godfather yet. So when we consider The Godfather being Godfather one and two, being one, mm -hmm. one single movie, of course, um, and one of my favorites of all time. So, so we, we ended up going through a lot of the movies that otherwise, you know, we hadn't had time to kind of sit down and watch. Thank goodness they're, you know, they, we don't watch many animated films anymore, which is really nice. And um, and so I think we got up to like 200 <laughs> at one point. And then the boys <laughs> said that they, my youngest was interviewed by a local newspaper um, and said, what was, you know, what did you learn from the pandemic? What did you take away? And he said, I learned that there's such a thing as seeing too many movies. <laughs> so, <laughs> that. And then I will say that I think one of the best things I think we can all agree on is the connection that we still found in mm -hmm. um meeting with more book clubs than ever because of zoom that yes. people connecting forming book clubs that are all around the country that had never formed before and and a new appreciation of hugs right i'm a we're huge huggers yes. in our house and man that felt good to finally be able to do that again Aww. love it what about you ross yeah you know the garden thing too like am with fan that was just you know i've always been a I mean, not always for the last 15 years, been a serious gardener, but there, it was, it was, you know, in a certain kind of way ramped up um, emotionally. And also that I was, again, I've also always been acutely aware of how much the garden is a source of sharing, like we're sharing stuff, other people are sharing their stuff, which is just like one little, it's just like one little emblem of all the stuff that we share. You know, it's just like, when you got too many zucchini, you're like, trying to get rid of your <laughs> you know, or tomatoes or whatever. So it was sort of in, um, wonderful to be deepening my garden practice and also that deepening of a garden practice, meaning actually I'm just like learning how to share better. Love it. Well, it's great. I'm glad we all found some type of joy um, throughout this craziness. Um, again, you book, your books are amazing. Um, you are all welcome at the Bookworm Bookstore. Um, 
hint, plug, all of that. Um, just oh. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate you all. I appreciate you guys taking this evening out. I appreciate all of our booksellers. I know we've had long days. Um, so I appreciate everybody hanging in towards the end. Um, these are all books that are coming out very shortly. So get them on your radar. Um, great discussion. So again, I thank you guys all. Enjoy the rest of tomorrow and all these amazing, 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 amazing um, seminars and things that we have going on. So have a great evening and talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a treat.